Hey, hi there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I'm Liv, your host and the Roman numeral of today's episode. That's right. This one's special because not only does the numeral describe the episode number we're on, but it also spells out my name. And yes, I am so cool that I am utterly thrilled by that fact. Deal with it. Well, friends, I'm so happy to be back with you today for a full-length new episode. Thanks so much for listening to the re-air of the stories of Medusa and Arachne last week. They are timely, but also sometimes I just have too much going on in my life and simply can't be prepared with a new episode. I'm trying to limit that happening, but sometimes it simply must. The summer has been really tough for me so far, and oh my god, it's barely begun. I've got so many things going on while also dealing with some record-breaking anxiety. Right now, I'm packing up my whole home in preparation for move at the end of July, but with any luck, I will be prepared enough to have episodes ready and raring to go so this won't happen again. In any event, thank you all for sticking with me. As I mentioned last week, we're back today with the Odyssey because it is July. Happy July! Happy Canada Day, really, which, when you're hearing this, was yesterday. Canada Day is better than the 4th of July, and that's really all I have to say on the subject. Next week, I'll be with you with another Pride episode, if outside of the designated Pride Month, because who the fuck cares? You can be proud and awesome all year round. Enough rambling. I've missed my main man. Last we met our intrepid Odysseus, he had journeyed in and out of the underworld, had conversations with the dead, and spurred some attention from the dread goddess Persephone, even if we weren't graced with her actual presence. When they return, Odysseus and his men, successful to Circe's island of Aiaia, she gives Odysseus and his remaining men instructions on where to go next and how to, finally, hopefully, fingers fucking crossed, return home to Ithaca. Circe directs them past the sirens, with Odysseus knowing how to escape their song, Next, my favorite duo in all of mythology, Scylla and Charybdis, but no one passes by these two completely unscathed. So last we saw Odysseus and his men, well, Scylla's six writhing, screaming heads had snatched six of Odysseus's men off the deck of his ship and pulled them high in the air. Odysseus could still hear the men screaming his name as they were slowly eaten by Scylla's collection of heads. This is episode 54, Don't Eat the Sun God's Cattle, The Odyssey, Part 7. Sing muses of all the many heads of the monster Scylla and her whirlpool pal Charybdis. Odysseus and his remaining men, far fewer than before, watch as Scylla devours the six men high up in her cave in the skyscraping rock. But they know they can't linger, she'll just end up with six more men in her mouths. So they continue on, finally freeing themselves of Scylla and Charybdis. Some accounts of the locations of the Odyssey place these two rocks as those on either side of the Strait of Messina, the strait that separates Sicily from the mainland of Italy. Odysseus and the few men he has left with him quickly reach the island of Helios, god of the sun, son of the titan Hyperion, and, though no one seems to say it in the Odyssey, father of Circe herself. It was just as Circe described this island would be reached quickly after surviving Scylla and Charybdis. The first thing they see on the island are Helios's cattle and sheep. The men can even hear the animals from the sea. Odysseus thinks back to what the ghost of Tiresias said about the island and to the very specific and important instructions that he was given by the wonderful witch Circe. Don't fucking touch that island, she told him, especially the livestock. As usual, I'm paraphrasing here, Homer didn't love the word fuck like I do. 
Odysseus tells his men this, that they've been told that they just cannot land on this island, that both Tiresias and Circe told them what horrible danger awaited them if they landed on the island. They must not land. The men, though, they don't like this answer. Eurylochus, who you'll remember from wanting to abandon the men Circe had turned into pigs and flee her island altogether, is the most angry about Odysseus's decision not to allow them to land on the island. A decision that, again, was deemed important by a ghost prophet and a fucking witch. I mean, these people know their shit when it comes to the recommendations, but whatever, Eurylochus, you go ahead and fuck all that shit up. Eurylochus is furious with Odysseus, accusing him of not ever needing rest or sleep and deliberately not allowing them to rest and cook a nice meal on the island. As if Odysseus was just doing things for shits and gigs. He rants at Odysseus about how unfair this is, and just it's complaint after complaint after complaint before he finally proposes that they land on the island just for the night. They'll stay at their camp, they'll rest, and they'll cook some food, and then they can leave first thing in the morning. The other men agree, with Eurylochus, all coming out Odysseus with this endless request. Odysseus doesn't have much choice, with every other man requesting the same thing. I mean, what can he do? We can't force them to leave. So he tries to handle this as best he can. He tells Eurylochus and the rest of the men... Fine, you're forcing my hand here, but if we must land on this island, you have to swear an oath. Odysseus tells the men they must swear, swear on everything they hold dear, that if they find any herd of cows or any flock of sheep, don't be fucking stupid enough to even consider killing even one of them. Stay far, far away from these animals and instead enjoy the food that Circe left us with. Eurylochus and the other men agree. They swear Odysseus' oath. The men have sworn their oath to Odysseus. They've sworn to stay far, far away from any animal they might find on the island, particularly the cattle and sheep. And so they land the ship and begin to make camp. They make dinner, enjoy some drinks, and have a good cry in remembrance of the men they've lost along the way, particularly those who only just met their fates as they crossed between Scylla and Charybdis. And finally, they fall asleep. In the night, Zeus blows a gust of wind, a storm, across the earth, covering everything with a thick, dreamy fog. Darkness falls and barely lightens even when dawn arrives on the island. They can't possibly set sail in this fog, and with the wind still blowing, they'd crash the ship and drown in an instant. Odysseus and the men drag the ship into a nearby cave, and Odysseus gives them another speech about avoiding Helios' animals while they wait out the storm of fog and darkness. He reminds them that they have more than enough supplies on board the ship, they have no need to go after Helios' cattle or his sheep, This is the sun god, he reminds them, and they are his animals. But the wind and the fog last a month. Odysseus' men stay away from the cattle and the sheep so long as the food and wine lasts. But a month is a long time, and the food just doesn't last that long. Eventually, the supplies they'd been given by Circe run out, and the men are forced to look elsewhere for food. For a while, again, they avoid Helios' animals, instead catching whatever fish and birds they can get their hands on. Meanwhile, Odysseus is looking for some guidance, some sign of how they can continue on their journey home after this seemingly endless delay. He crosses the island, praying to the gods. But... With Odysseus away from the camp, Eurylochus comes up with a plan. He proposes to the men that they finally do away with their hunger by sacrificing the best of Helios' cattle to the gods and feasting on them. 
When they reach Ithaca, he says, they'll build a temple to Helios and fill it with treasure. That should surely appease him. And if it doesn't, if he's so angry about the loss of one or two cows that he and his fellow gods sink their ship, well, Eurylochus proposes to the men, I'd rather drown on seawater at the hands of the gods than die slowly of hunger on this island. And the other men agree. These stupid stupid men. So they find the best of Helios's cattle, and they sacrifice them as best they can with what little supplies they have left, and they eat whatever's left over. Meanwhile, Odysseus, who had fallen asleep on the other side of the island, wakes with a start and he races back to the ship only to smell the distinct scent of roasting meat as he nears the camp. Odysseus calls out to Zeus and the other gods, accusing them of blinding him with sleep only for his men to do something horribly, tragically stupid while he slept. But it's too late. One of the daughters of Helios has already seen what the men had done. She flies off to let the sun god know that his precious, beloved cattle had been sacrificed by these useless, stupid mortals on the beach by their ship. Helios was about as angry as one might expect, based on all the warnings Odysseus received, and he calls on the other gods to punish Odysseus's men for what they've done. He tells Zeus and the others that if they don't punish these men, he will bring his chariot to the underworld instead, delighting only the land of the dead with the brightness of the sun. So Helios calls on Zeus and the other gods to punish these men, just as everyone predicted. And Zeus is happy to. He won't risk their not having the sun. How could he be so awful to so many women if it were dark? It simply can't happen. Anyway, that detail isn't in the Odyssey, but I think it's pretty easy to conclude that this is part of Zeus's reasoning when he answers Helios, telling the sun god that he will immediately smite Odysseus's ship and shatter it into a million pieces across the wine-dark sea. Odysseus pauses now as he recounts this part of the story to the Phaeacians at the feast. He tells them he heard this part from Calypso, who heard it from Hermes. How else could he know the happenings of the gods? For a thousands-of-year-old story, the narrative devices are used incredibly well. No one's mixing up narrator omniscience here. No, Odysseus tells us exactly how he could have learned the inner workings of the gods. Back on the shore, by the remains of the sacrificed cattle, Odysseus tries to reprimand his men. But what's the use? What's done is done. Whatever the gods will do to punish them has already been decided. It's only a matter of time now. And the gods move quickly. The signs of the severity of what they'd done appear almost immediately, The hides of the cattle, discarded on the beach, begin to twitch as if still the skin of live animals. The meat, whatever is yet to be eaten, cooked or raw, starts to moo. Can only imagine the chill running down the spines of each of these men as they're forced to consider what they've done. But finally... The wind dies down after the month-long storm, and the fog subsides. The men immediately scramble onto the ship and set sail, not wanting to waste another minute on the island where they've just done what they've done, let alone another minute not en route back to Ithaca in yet another attempt to get home after so long at sea. As soon as the ship is out to sea... All sight of land disappears. It's only blue in every direction. Zeus sends a storm cloud to hang low over the ship, constantly threatening their journey. The wind picks up, gusting angrily. The west wind zephyr comes screaming at them, bringing in a torrential storm of epic proportions. And the ship breaks apart, slowly, torturously. 
Zeus sends a thunderbolt at the ship, and in an instant, every man but Odysseus has fallen overboard and drowned. Just like that, he's alone, the only one who didn't partake in the killing of Helios's sacred cattle. Odysseus is alone on a ship that's half-crushed and quickly sinking into the wine-dark sea. Every other man has been thrown off board, drowning at the hand of Zeus for what they did to Helios's cattle. But Odysseus remains, and he finds whatever remnants of his ship that he can, he holds them together with what few supplies he can get his hands on, and he floats. Odysseus floats backward, the current taking him back toward the massive rocks, that took his men away from him that month ago. He floats back, right back, to Scylla and Charybdis. When he reaches the rocks, there isn't anything he can do but reach up just in time to grasp onto the single fig tree that hangs over the water. The small makeshift raft is sucked quickly into Charybdis's whirlpool as Odysseus holds tightly onto the fig tree, hoping with all he has that this will be one of the moments that Charybdis' whirlpool spits back whatever it sucked down. In time, he's lucky, and Charybdis does spit back up what remains of his raft. If it was ramshackle when he floated into Charybdis, it's in far worse shape now. But Odysseus manages to drop back down to the sea from the overhanging fig tree, just in time to grab onto one of the few pieces of wood that remain— and even luckier, somehow manages to avoid the eyes of Scylla, paddling with his arms away from these rocks and into the relative safety of the open sea, where, again, he floats. Odysseus floats for nine days, and finally, on the tenth, the gods push him toward Calypso's island. There, the nymph we heard about at the very beginning of Odysseus' story— Loves and cares for him for many years. At first, he's into her. She's a hot nymph, and he's been away from his wife for a very long time. But that gets old. She gets boring. And we're back to where we started. Let's Talk About Mitts Baby is sponsored by Signature Hardware. If you're looking for that perfect item to take your kitchen, bathroom, or just your house up a notch, head over to SignatureHardware.com. They have, honestly, some of the most beautiful housewares I've ever seen. The vanities? Oh my god vanities. Who knew they could be so absolutely stunning? And I am a big bathtub person. So yes, I've just longingly scrolled through all of their bathtub options because why not? They've got beautiful bathroom furnishings and kitchen furnishings. You could get an incredible rain shower or this a beautiful farmhouse sink or maybe just a beautiful one of those things that hangs over your bathtubs. So you can have a glass of wine. I've actually picked out eight different furnishings that really stood out to me on Signature Hardware. They're my style. I just love them. They're absolutely just goals. See for yourself at SignatureHardware.com myths. You will be amazed at the variety and the quality. Odysseus finishes telling his story to the Phaeacians, having come full circle to where it began when he finally leaves Calypso's island and makes his way to their land. The Phaeacians look on in awe as Odysseus finishes his tale. I mean, who the fuck could have imagined such a wild and dramatic story coming from one person? So many monsters, so many stupid decisions by stupid humans, witches, gods, storms. A wild ride, to say the least. Alcinous, the king of the Phaeacians, immediately calls upon all the people assembled there to donate gifts and treasure to Odysseus, to pay him back for all the horror and heartbreak he's gone through. They pack all this onto a new ship, once more bound for Ithaca, and once more they sacrifice cattle to Zeus in preparation for what will, hopefully, be Odysseus's final attempt to journey home. 
Of course, there's far more that transpires before Odysseus leaves, because, oh man, is there a lot of toasting and drinking and formalities, and oh man, does Homer lay out literally every imaginable detail, but I will save you those, even if I haven't let another single detail pass us by in this endless series of episodes I've done on this one book. With final blessings towards the Phaeacians generally, and the Queen Arete herself, Odysseus is finally, finally, finally heading home to Ithaca once more. As he settles in on the ship, he falls asleep. And the ship moves quickly, sailed by the men of Phaeacia. It speeds through the water so quickly that when dawn arrives the next day, they can see Ithaca in the distance. The men moor the ship and transport Odysseus, still sleeping, to the warm, dry sand of the beach. They move all the gifts and treasure that he'd been given so that it's tucked behind an olive tree, and they leave, Odysseus still fast asleep. But finally, finally, finally home. Odysseus is home, but the gods are still watching. Poseidon sees Odysseus arrive home in Ithaca, and he is less than amused. He spent so much of his time trying to ruin Odysseus. He'd sent storms and smashed ships, and still, here Odysseus is, home at last. Poseidon isn't happy. He calls on his brother Zeus, complaining about how Odysseus has returned home, and what were the Phaeacians thinking bringing him there? Why, the Phaeacians were descendants of himself, and here they are helping his arch-enemy Odysseus? So, very quickly, because gods, Poseidon changes his anger over from Odysseus to the Phaeacians, because Odysseus is home now, so I mean, what can he do about it? No, now Poseidon is out to get the Phaeacians. He runs some ideas past his bro. Okay, how about when the Phaeacians' ship nears home, I smash into smithereens? Then I overwhelm them by putting a mountain there to, bo- to block them from ever guiding anyone I don't like home ever again. Nah, Zeus says. How about instead you wait until the people on land in Phaeacia see the ship coming to land, then you turn it into stone, but make it look like the ship still, so it's like extra sad and mean. Then you surround them with a the mountain so they'll never get to see again. Yeah, Poseidon says, that's a great plan. Truly the right amount of punishment for them helping one guy get home after 10 years of wandering. So Poseidon goes ahead and heads over to the land of the Phaeacians. And as the ship speeds towards home, he turns it into stone and gives it a good smack with his palm, making it forever rooted to the seafloor. The people of Phaeacia look on in horror as their friends are turned to stone stuck forever so close to home. They're confused, but King Alcinous has an idea of what's happening. He gathers the people of his land together and tells them something he was told by his father so long ago. His father foresaw that Poseidon would one day punish them for helping so many travelers reach home, that he would do this to a ship and also hide them with a mountain. Alcinous calls on all his people to sacrifice to Poseidon, to please him in every way imaginable, so that they might avoid the whole being hidden by a mountain thing, because that would really be a bitch. <laughs> Meanwhile, old Odysseus wakes up on the beach. He's alone, surrounded by his treasure, and he doesn't recognize where he is. He's simply been gone too long. And he overreacts. I mean, maybe it's not overreacting because he's seen some shit at this point. But when he doesn't recognize it, he loses his mind. He wonders where he is now. Are the people mean? Are there creatures that are going to eat him? Those Phaeacians are liars, he thinks. They said they'd bring me home, etc., etc. Much panic when he could just think to himself, hey, Maybe they weren't liars, and they did take me home, and I'm finally here. But whatever. He doesn't recognize it. It's been 20 years, so that makes some sense, I guess. He loses his shit. 
Athena must step in here. She must calm him down and make him realize he's being a big old baby. She disguises herself as a shepherd and approaches Odysseus. Odysseus is supremely excited to see another person and throws himself at this random shepherd asking for protection and guidance. He asks where he is. Is it an island or a peninsula? Who lives here? With a smile and a twinkle in his eye, this Athena, disguised as a shepherd, tells Odysseus that he must be from a distant land if he doesn't know where he stands now. Why, why, he says, this country is famous. It's rough, not fit for horses, not big but not infertile. They grow endless corn and make endless wine here. There's good water and the land is great for goats and cattle. There's lots of trees, so many kinds of trees. He describes his land and... Then finally, my god, Homer is a wordy bastard. This shepherd discloses to Odysseus that he's landed on the island of Ithaca, a place well known as far away as Troy. Thank you all for listening as we continue on the story of my beloved, if at times stupid and trusting, Odysseus. If you thought this series on the Odyssey wouldn't be as long and extensive as the Iliad, well, ha, I'm a lunatic. And guess what? This was only book 12 of 24, so we'll be with Odysseus forever because you simply can't rush Homer. It's too good. Odysseus' story is too wonderful to tell. I also want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has donated books to me. I've been so amazed by the number that keep coming in. You're so wonderful, and I'm so appreciative. I think I have like 10 new books now. My list is dwindling now, but I'll be doing some further research to expand it into more books that will help with the podcast or at times simply be classics related books that I want. You can decide how you want to donate should you want to. The people at Monroe's to the bookstore have been so wonderful, and they're so happy to have you all supporting their beautiful little store by donating to me. You're not only helping me and the podcast, but you're helping out one of Canada's most beloved and wonderful independent brick and mortar bookstores. That's important. So thank you from me and them. I won't keep you with more end notes today. So just thank you. You're wonderful. And I'm so lucky to have such incredible listeners. I'm Liv, and I love this shit. <laughs>